On today's World Insight, the world economy reeling from pandemic uncertainty. How are nations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas coping? And the global tourist industry on life support. China's biggest online travel agency tells us about the shocks to the industry. I just to let them know how bad the situation is. Here is our host, Jian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. Today we are going to still focus on COVID-19. As we know, over the past week, pandemic fears and uncertainty battered the global economy. World shares all fell sharply as COVID-19 spread to more countries. Much of the world is facing the sinking realization that billions of lives will be seriously disrupted and that the economic implications are beyond dire. So what can be done to keep confidence? Before our discussion, take a look at this. Stocks were hemorrhaging. The red on the screens could have been blood. Again, a halt in trading for 15 minutes on Wall Street on Monday, the third time that the circuit breaker has been tripped since last week. European shares retreated after an initial bounce on Tuesday and kept financial markets on edge, while Asian stocks tumbled in choppy trade on Wednesday. I think definitely it's a health crisis. That's first and foremost. We have, uh, there's no timeline on how we're going to be able to solve this or cure it, uh, and I think that makes it much different than a financial crisis. Since last week, stimulus packages are no doubt helping. The U.S. Federal Reserve cut interest rates to near zero on Sunday. Today, we reduced the target range for our policy interest rate by one percentage point bringing it close to zero, and said that we expect to maintain the rate at this level until we're confident that the economy has weathered recent events and is on track to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Our commitment to provide support in this time of need. The Eurozone had so far deployed a fiscal boost worth 1% of its GDP to help the economy and pledged to do more if needed. The IMF stands ready to mobilize its full one trillion U.S. dollar lending capacity to help member countries deal with the crisis. The World Bank Group has announced two billion dollars more, bringing its commitment to 14 billion dollars in funds. But more could be needed before this is over. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. The world comes to grips with the reality. The volatility will continue until markets are certain the situation is under control. And clinician. On the turbulence in the global economy, joining us in Brussels, Fraser Cameron, senior advisor at the European Policy Center. In Los Angeles, William Lee, chief economist of Milken Institute. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Um, I want to start by asking you whether the Fed is running out of tools to give more confidence to the current stage of the economy, Mr. Lee. Far from running out of tools, the Fed has a lot of tools left in its basket because the first set of tools was put out there to set the stage, to lower interest rates, lower credit, the big bazookas are pulled out. Now they're going to be pulling out macroprudential policies. That's a fancy word to say. They're going to target the supply of credit to the people and companies that are most affected by the virus and make sure that the financial infrastructure is solid and in place to be able to channel that credit when it's needed as the recovery starts to begin after the virus is contained. What are you specifically referring to, Mr. Lee? I, I'm thinking of uh, the repo markets and the, um, the, the, the short-term funding markets. Right now, the Fed is starting to put out a commercial paper facility to ensure that companies, when they're in distress, could go to the banks or, or go to the markets themselves and to be able to grab funding from the markets to be able to tide them over as they suffer from cash flows and the lack of sales. Mm. Now, of course, the U.S. Uh, is at the 
early stage, quote unquote, uh, compare at least to some of the other countries in terms of fighting COVID-19. The country is busy preparing for uh, some of the later uh, possibilities. So Mr. Li, do you think the machine, the, the machines, let's just say, the financial economic machines can still operate as they should be as we go further, quote unquote, into the fire? What we're all concerned with is the market turmoil. Why is it that the equity markets keep crashing? And I think what we have to understand is equity markets are looking forward and trying to, to understand the process by which the virus will uh, progress throughout the world, but also in the United States. And so this process of price discovery is keeping the markets with a lot of uncertainty. That's something that I think we have to deal with. But the Fed mm -hmm. policy that's been put in place now and the administration's policy is to make sure that the underlying financial infrastructure is there to allow the price discovery. Sometimes the price discovery is very violent, and sometimes it, the holes in the market start to develop, and they, the, the Fed's effort right now is to plug every hole they see. Right. We understand uh, in a few hours it's likely the U.S. president going to announce some plans. We do not know exactly the content about people's Medicare and Social Security as well as uh, uh, what the government will do at the federal level for the catering industry, hotels, restaurants, bars, things like that. Uh, Mr. Lee, what can we expect? I think the president and uh, policies has been trying to learn lessons from China. That is, come in big with a lot of spending to try to contain the health crisis, and then come in big to support the people as they have to stay home and the economy shuts down, both on the supply side and on the demand side, and then to make sure that there's money given to people so that when they come out of the recover in the recovery stage, there's money to spend. So targeting the money to the victims of the virus is really critical, and I think that's one of the lessons that we have learned from China, which is get to the health crisis first and detect it and contain it, and then make sure that, as China is doing now, coming out of the, of the virus situation and trying to restart the economic engine, mm -hmm. that the, there's enough fuel that is enough money to be able to start it in the hands of companies and in the hands of individuals. Mm. Mr. Li, you may not know necessarily that China is still in the middle of this fight uh, because the situation has been evolving. Now, instead of uh, uh, some of the homegrown cases, uh, import cases have become one of the biggest concerns. 150 already uh, we have reported uh, so far imported cases of uh, COVID-19. Having said that, though, I want to continue to ask you a little bit more along the line you just answered. Uh, what about uh, some of the specific issues that uh, the federal level has to deal with, and how is that likely to be the division of labor? Has it always been a very tricky issue in the U.S. Uh, uh, between the federal and also the state level in terms of what policies to use to boost the economy and also in terms of the money that needs to be spent on the emergency of the health issue uh, for the next uh, two, three, and um, three weeks and probably a month or a month and a half. Right. The, the, the timeline that China has set out uh, for the rest of the world to see is that if you're successful in containing things uh, the, and, and, and limiting the amount of contagion, you eventually will, after two or three months, start to see that the internal contagion is gone and you need to worry about external contagion. And so I think the U.S. is trying to be preemptive by putting in these travel restrictions to try to limit the amount of external uh, inflow right now. The, the key you are, question is absolutely spot on about the United States. The federal and state governments are, are, have a tension between who spends on what, and those are being negotiated now. But I think what President Trump has been trying to emphasize is mm. states can take the initiative and we'll give you the money as you need it. Mm. Okay, let we, let's go to also Mr. Cameron. Uh, after drinking some water, Mr. Cameron, I want to ask you specifically about the European situation because uh, quite a number of the European countries, in fact all of the EU member states, are having COVID-19 to fight at this moment. A very heavy moment, I guess, for the European continent. So uh, what about, on the one hand, fighting the virus and the pandemic? On the other hand, still try to keep the economy in shape, at least, or at least intact. Well, it's a very difficult balancing act because uh, most governments have announced huge 
emergency packages of uh, loans, guarantees to try and keep businesses afloat. But of course, nobody is going to resume economic activity, and certainly not like the way we're used to, until the virus is brought under control, until people start going shopping again, and people start traveling again, people start going back to work again. So until we get it really under control, this is a damage limitation exercise. And of course, we can look at what's happened in China and say, well, that's one way to tackle it, and it may be the trajectory along which Europe goes. But nobody knows for sure, and that's the problem. It's the uncertainty that's yeah. really shaking the markets here. Mm. Mr. Cameron, another question is, uh, you know, China was experiencing, uh, of course, a lot of challenges during the past two to three uh, months, uh, but still the economy managed to grow uh, with very limited possibility with the earlier already existing infrastructure. What I'm talking about is e-payment, for example, delivery services, logistic services. But of course, uh, well, the European... Well, Europe, the projections are certainly for almost um, zero growth this year. Mm -hmm. Depends what happens, obviously, in the second part of the year. But most economists are predicting more likely there will be a recession throughout the European uh, area this year. Mm. But, but what about, uh, you know, with the current situation, how to deal with it, but still manage to do some production and manage to still have the business running? Uh, China's case, I'm not sure whether it's uh, suitable for everybody because infrastructures are different. Uh, China has earlier already had the e-payment quite popular among its population. And also the delivery and logistic services never rested over the past the two to three months. Um, with the earlier already existing, once again, operation and scale. Uh, but Mr. Cameron, uh, how much do you think the Europeans are likely to take on what China experienced and experimented? Or maybe the European continents and economies are thinking about something new or of their own characteristics, Mr. Cameron? Well, it's a mix. I mean, obviously, the Europeans don't want to drop the big project called the Green Deal, and that's why governments like in Germany have introduced you know, new measures to boost uh, hydrogen development, especially for vehicles. So there's new developments that are ongoing. At the same time, the immediate crisis is to try and protect jobs, try and protect, protect some companies from not going bust, and allowing people some breathing space so that they can see how they can maneuver best over the next two or three months, and it will vary from industry to industry. Obviously, the travel and hospitality industry is the worst hit here, but also car production is stopping in many countries just now as consumers are not prepared to go out and buy. So this is affecting supply chains, mm -hmm. including supply chains between Europe and China. So that's the problem at the moment. No one quite knows exactly how long this will go on for. Yeah. Mr. Cameron, however, on the other hand, we have been hearing from the European uh, companies. Uh, some of the biggest ones in the world are trying to convert their businesses into something new, at least uh, temporarily, to produce, on the one hand, uh, some of the materials that is urgently needed uh, to the, for the fight against COVID-19. For example, cosmetic companies that are pro producing even sanitizers. Uh, uh, so. Well, I was told that uh, Mr. Cameron's uh, connection is uh, temporarily disrupted. Now, let me come back to Mr. Lee. Same question, too, uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, some of the companies uh, which are well-known in their own sector try to convert and change so that they can produce something uh, urgently need now in the market. Uh, can you tell me about whether that could be a possibility for some of the companies? for the future, near future? Here in the, yes, absolutely. Here, that's a great question. Here in the United States, uh, people are learning to change their business models. They're changing the type of output the, and the way in which they use their people, their labor. People are now telecommuting, uh, the teledoctor services, that is if you have a, a, a problem, medical problem, instead of going to the hospital or going to doctor's offices, they're using a telephone to call doctors for medical advice. Uh, so, so there's a, a lot of remote production and remote consumption being put in place in the United States today, which I think is a great thing because mm. it allows much more flexibility in the production structure. So going forward, one of the strengthening characteristics that will come out of this vi terrible virus uh, uh, situation is that the economic structure will become more resilient and more flexible. Mm, we hope that will be the case. But Mr. Lee, you know, earlier we were playing some footages of Costco. Of course, a lot of people go there to shop. Uh, but 
Uh, recently, we have also heard, uh, suggested by the federal level, uh, the U.S. government, uh, for U.S. consumers to buy grocery for one week's use only. Uh, well, many people have been suspecting what this means. Does this mean uh, that the shops will not be able to provide a sufficient amount of uh, groceries that people need them? Or uh, does this mean that uh, hoarding is going to put some of the shops into problem? Uh, Mr. D, I'm sure you have better grasp of the real situation than we do here. Mr. D. Well, one of, the thing, one of the things we know as an economist who studied consumer behavior, we know for sure that globally, whenever there's an economic disaster or a natural disaster, people immediately hoard toilet paper and buy fresh milk. And, 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 uh, and it just goes on to other consumer staples. So one of the things that, that has happened in the United States is that even though our retail supply chain and our grocery supply chains are completely intact, no destruction whatsoever because of the virus, people are just getting scared. Yeah. And that lack of information is one of the biggest problems that they face by the, any authority globally, whether it's Europe, China, or the United States, you need to tell people what is the consequence of bad behavior, and bad behavior is consumer hoarding. Mm. Uh, Mr. Cameron is with us now. I hope you can hear me wonderful. Uh, Mr. Cameron, were similar situation in the European economies? We are still having some problems uh, linking to Brussels. Uh, we hope uh, it will be connected uh, a bit later. Once again, Mr. Lee, coming back to you, thank you for uh, being supportive throughout the conversation. Uh, we earlier, Mr. Lee, have been talking about some of the issues that the consumers and investors around the world have noticed. But there are other things, Mr. Lee, if I could have you also here uh, to take a note of, is the underlining transformation that we're likely to see of our economies and of the trade mechanism and of priorities of economies and of the balance act every economy has to take and the, and the result it has to bear as a result of it. So Mr. Lee, what do you make of this much bigger picture? That's such a great question. I'm glad you brought it up because one of the things that I have uh, been writing about is one of the lessons learned out of this process, starting with the trade agreement with, the, with China, is the, the understanding that globalization is much more complicated than it used to be thought of. You cannot take simplistic globalization principles and say, let me specialize the supply chain and have only one source for my inputs or one source of intermediary inputs uh, and one source for clients and customers. So I think one of the lessons that we will learn as the industrial structure starts to gear up again is that every company is going to be asking, where are my backup supply chains? Where are my backup customers? If my customers in one place start to go offline, where will I get other customers? And so diversifying both on the supply side and the demand side will be one of the key challenges for every CEO going forward and every CEO is going to have a different answer, but certainly it will not be to specialize your supply chain and be vulnerable to supply shocks and demand shocks of the sort that we've seen but caused by this global virus problem. Indeed, uh, Mr. Lee, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, but at the same time, diversification at this moment, particularly at a time of crisis or right out of crisis, that does mean it takes a lot of money. There's a bigger price to it to diversify than, let's just say, in a very peaceful moment. So uh, would people be able to afford that? I mean, after all, when we have a global supply chain, the beauty of it is the cost will be minimized to the most and also to incorporate all the best and advantages of everywhere. So will the thought of having diversification really rival the advantages of having a real global supply chain? Great question. And, and, and the response to that as an economist is, you cannot have one end of the answer. The solution has got to be a trade-off. You have a trade-off between minimizing cost 
and minimizing risk. And you cannot minimize both at the same time. So somewhere we're going to have to pick a different trade-off between the risk of being caught out with a supply shock or demand shock and the lower, lowering the cost of production so that you can maximize the well-being of your economy. And, 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 and I think we have gone, the, certainly the virus situation has shown, we've gone too far in minimizing costs and have not taken enough consideration into minimizing risk mm. and the risk of being stopped out, the, the risk of having no inventories, the risk of having no supply. Those are the risks that we have to bring back into the picture. Mm. Mr. Lee, I've been talking to companies, a big and small, small, medium and big uh, sizes, and also whether it's Chinese companies or international companies. They've been telling me cash flow is going to be a huge problem from now on. Um, no matter how big they are. So, Mr. Lee, when everyone is crying for cash flow, what does that mean uh, for the next uh, stage of financial policies? And also the, the cooperation among economies and financial bodies about those policies? Great question. I, the, the, the issue of cash flow is a temporary one. We both agree that cash flow was not a problem before the virus because if the capital is making money, it, it has, has clients, everything is fine. So really we talk about temporary tidying over companies that have these cash flow problems because of locked up supplies and locked up demand. So, so the key issue is can governments supply the credit that's necessary for the companies to tide them over this period. It could be a long period. It could be a, a, as much as you know, half a year to a year. So, 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 the, so the Federal Reserve, for example, is targeting all their efforts to being able to make sure the financial plumbing is in place to be able to supply the credit. China is doing the same thing by bolstering its banking system and bolstering its monetary policy, lowering the cost of credit to be able to make sure that the credit is available to the people and the companies as they need it to tide them over. Going forward, I think we have to, again, consider risk management and diversification. Now, sometimes people call it diversification. You worsen your profits without a doubt, but you also minimize your risk. And I think that's the new calculus that every CEO is going to have to conduct, both in China, Europe, and around the world. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, uh, this is a critical moment. Uh, international cooperation is extremely important. However, uh, Mr. Li, we are also experiencing at the same time a big test of globalization. This one probably is even bigger than geopolitics earlier. So Mr. Lee, how is this, this specific uh, pandemic going to transform our understanding of a lot of things? Of course, we're still in the middle of it, so we might not be able to think about everything clearly, uh, you know, to the at most, but still, at this point, what's your thought? Let me steal a phrase uh, from China, which is, globalization will have national characteristics going forward. And I think that's something that we all have to keep in mind, which is to say, globalization per se will be adapted for the needs of the national economies, and a lot of it will involve repatriation of production so that you minimize these risks that I mentioned earlier. But certainly, globalization going forward will change, but I think it will be changing for the better because it takes into account a lot of the factors that were not taken into account before, like national security and, 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 and just diversifying your, your, your demand and supply baskets. Mm. Uh, talking about national security, if I could just follow up a little bit, Mr. Lee, earlier there was uh, a maximization of using the phrase of uh, national security, probably overused uh, for various purposes uh, in terms of trade war, for example. Mr. Lee, are we going to see those uh, examples even further developed uh, for the near future after this crisis we're doing it? I hope not. I, I, I think one of the things that we have to understand is international cooperation is absolutely key because the principles of globalization is that people have to cooperate in order to benefit globally and each, in each other. But I think one of the things that we have recognized is a virus of this sort is 
doesn't recognize borders. So mm -hmm. passing best practices, passing information is absolutely critical. Uh, how we pass the information, what tools we use, those will have very national characteristics. Every national characteristic, every government and every people are going to have to decide what will suit us best in dealing with other countries. Mm. And I think the, the, that's the, the, the realm of diplomats, and that's out of my purview as an economist. Mm -hmm. But I think as an international economist, it'll be critical to be able to have both international mix and national uh, principles as well. Finally, before we go, we got 20 and 30 seconds for you, Mr. Lee. Will nationalism on the rise as a result of the complicated situation everybody is facing at home? And what does that mean for international trade and certainly uh, economic cooperation policy? I think without a doubt when you have a big hit like this, people focus on what's going on in their own neighborhoods and focus on trying to correct what's going on at home. But I think once we get the situation at home contained and people start to have normal lives again, I think the cross-border and the global efforts that were there before will not only continue, they will blossom because they will blossom in a way that takes into account new national characteristics. And, and just as socialism with Chinese characteristics is uh, the catchphrase in China, globalization with national characteristics will be the catchphrase for all businesses. Very interesting thoughts. Uh, William Lee, the chief economist of Milken Institute. We hope uh, things are getting better soon. Thank you so much, sir. And also be healthy, also with your family as well. Thank you. You are watching World Insight with me, Tianwei. Still to come on our program. The global tourist industry on life support. China's biggest online travel agency tells us about the shocks to the industry and also their efforts to make a difference right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. The COVID-19 outbreak hit the travel industry fast and hard. Though some tourist sites in China have reopened, transportation and service businesses are still facing an uphill battle. The Shanghai-based Trip.com, also known as Ctrip, is China's biggest online travel agency and the second largest in the world. When the outbreak started in late January, as lockdowns and quarantines were in place, the company was one of the first to offer customers free refunds and pioneered a one-click cancellation policy. On one hand, Trip.com has to serve grumbling customers. On the other, the company is managing losses. Its shares fell by more than 10 percent this year. Trip International CEO Jay Sun and Chairman James Liang announced together earlier this month they will give up their personal salaries starting in March in order to set an example for the whole staff. In my earlier interview with Ms. Sun, the CEO, she told me that they are hoping for the best and certainly working for it, but also preparing for the worst. Now we are joined by Skype by Jane Sanjie, CEO of Trade.com Group. Jane, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Since our last talk at Davos World Economic Forum, things have been changing so much. So last week, you and also the chairman of Trade.com have claimed that both of you would have zero salary from March. Is that what you're going to do this month? Yes, uh, we start uh, with the top management. So both our founder and executive chair, chairman, James, and myself voluntarily take zero uh, pay uh, starting from February. And our top management team also are voluntarily uh, taking 50% pay cut uh, to take the lead, preserve resources to make sure we can fight through the most challenging time uh, to handle the crisis right now. Yeah. Things are becoming very difficult for all of us. 
but I guess for the trip industry and travel industry particularly, you are listed on the NASDAQ, I mean trip.com, as the largest platform online for uh, trips and also uh, travel bookings. So what about the latest the stock market crash for you guys? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, travel industry is hit the most uh, during this uh, challenging time. However, uh, I think once the market resumes, uh, we expect uh, there are delayed demand and people will start to travel again once the virus uh, is under control. For domestic travel, we are already taking the lead to make sure we initiate different promotion plans to encourage the industry players to take the lead and uh, to make sure the recovery is another way. Mm. Jane, let's talk about the international market first because Trip.com is supposed to operate all over the world. You're the largest, one of the largest in the world. So what about that? Because now we have got the news that the confirmed cases of COVID-19 outside China have already exceeded the number of that in China, which means globally it's a pandemic and it's very severe. What about the international business? Yeah, I think if we look at our business, about 65% of our business comes from uh, the domestic travel market. For us, uh, we saw the hit on the domestic market before our international market got the hit. Uh, now, since the virus is well under control within domestic China, we expect uh, domestic travel will recover uh, before the international business as well. Mm. But what about for your international market? That's also a big share, a chunk of your business. And also we have seen uh, travel bans uh, from countries against China. And now with more confirmed cases outside China, China would put certain kinds of travel restrictions and also quarantine measures against anyone coming into the country. It's just one of those measures mm -hmm. you need to take in order to control the virus. Mm -hmm. So what about that, the international business? Uh, right now, our priority for international business is really to take good care of our customers when they have needs to change, refund, cancel, or delay their trips. Uh, and we have experience uh, for the international business just as we did for the domestic business. Uh, but our expectation is about if every country uh, learn from what China has done, hopefully, uh, China took about one to two months to get the virus under control. Uh, we are hopeful that learning uh, from what China has done, uh, leveraging what China has gained uh, from the experience perspective, within one to two months, the international business will also see the bottom and start to recover. I was off the record talking to some of your partners, uh, Jane, uh, if I could report to you. They were telling sure. me that you were personally on the phone persuading them to provide the free cancel services for many of your customers. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. to me, it's amazing. How could you, as a CEO, you know, personally on the phone, talk to almost many of your important partners? So tell me, how was that That's process right. like uh, when you tried to persuade? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of uh, yeah. give and take you have to provide in order to make sure that your customer will enjoy that? first step we took is uh, for patients and for the medical personnel, uh, if they travel with us, we offer 100% coverage if they need to refund, cancel, or delay their trips. The second step we took is as Chinese government uh, published a policy that non-group travelers will be allowed uh, for going abroad, we immediately need to put in place the measures to take care of our customers. So we launched 100 million uh, natural disaster relief fund to take care of our customers. And then the volume start to uh, increase significantly and we, as a third step, we double uh, the natural disaster relief fund. After that, we need to work with the industry players just to make sure everyone is brought to the front line. So uh, I was working with our team at the front line handling the customer request uh, on 24 hours nonstop. So I understand what is customer's uh, request. So I pass on these information 
and by talking to the CEOs of major uh, hotels, uh, cruise ships, airlines, local tour operators, rental car companies, etc. Uh, just to let them know how bad the situation is in China. And for them, many of them uh, live outside of China and really don't know what's going on within China. So some of them uh, have a lot of uh, experience working with our team. So they said, yeah, you know, Jane, whatever you say, we support you. But some of them, they are a big organization. It takes time for them to sink in. And I told them I understand the situation. I understand you are a big organization. You need time to make the right decision. But this is what we have seen. This is what we recommend for you to consider. So gradually, they, everyone come together uh, with the same conclusion that at this moment, uh, we need to 100% support the travelers around the world. Uh, so I'm very glad the whole globe uh, team uh, come together. So I really think through this uh, disaster, we really feel how important uh, everyone, every country works together. It's really one globe, one team. Yeah. Well, you know, Jane, you talk about several sectors among the travel industry. Which sector, according to your latest analysis, is likely to be hit the most? What are some of the strategies you've been recommending to them? as a platform. Yeah, uh, so if we look at the segments, hotel and air tickets are the major anchor products. So we have to develop a strategy that is very scalable. Uh, for example, when we first received the phone calls, our call center employees contact the hotel uh, call center employees. And that is not very efficient because uh, call center employees are not authorized to, to make a decision on the spot. So what we did is we gave recommendation to the CEOs around the world. Um, and I, I, I told them, you know, the mass of China, we really need to have a scalable policy if the hotels or the air tickets are not used we should 100% refund the customer. If it is partially used, maybe we can consider a 50% refund policy just to make it very easy uh, for the team in the front line to process. And we have millions of customers waiting on the line. Uh, so gradually, I think in a global spaces, uh, we have common uh, methodology to develop a scalable API to develop a scalable policy. So once the disaster hits, we can very quickly, efficiently uh, handle the pressure uh, from all front from every country. Right. Now, when you think about the other countries, because now China was earlier in the fire, now almost coming out of fire, but still very cautiously. Huh? Uh, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, the other economies, particularly Europe, is now worse hit by the COVID-19. Uh, North America mm -hmm. also you see signs of that uh, since mm -hmm. last week. So Jane, uh, with mm -hmm. some of the things that you have developed together with your team and your partners around the world, be eligible and applicable for your partners to use in their own market and when they are using on a, a scalable uh, possibility with their customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the philosophy our team have used it has always been be prepared for the worst, but hope for the best. So if 100% of the customer needs to cancel or delay their trips, what are we going to do, right? So what we did is we have a um, uh, one-click uh, automatic cancel uh, technology platform to make it as automatic as possible. And then with the commercial team, we need to work with our partners to develop a scalable policy. Uh, so it's applied uh, to many different countries at different times uh, instead of case-by-case case, uh, discussion, which is not going to be enough in this kind of situation. Jane, but what about for your own business? I mean, when mm -hmm. things are going in the direction that we do not want it to be, which is now, you know, COVID-19, mm -hmm. nobody can do anything about it except the social distancing, quarantine, uh, containment and also mitigation. So uh, mm -hmm. what would you do in order to survive and probably survive in a better shape? And maybe not to have zero salaries all the time anymore, uh, Jane. Uh -huh. <laughs> what about cash flow? <laughs> what about uh, consumer yeah. confidence? Tell me more about that. Yeah. Uh, so 
we uh, need to do a couple of things. One is make the team as efficient as possible. So for example, there are lots of technology uh, backlog uh, in terms of uh, project. Uh, when the business is very busy, uh, we always focus on what drives the volume. Now the volume is done, right? So the project that will save us uh, on the cost side get priority and scalability and a historical project that is uh, not going to be uh, seen the return right away gets priority. So our technology team, product team, service team are very busy training our employees, getting the project prioritized to welcome, to be get ready uh, for the uptick uh, for the business. And then secondly, our employees also are taking lots of trainings because in the busy days, they are so busy either to handle the increase of volume or handle the cancellation. So for CTRIP University, we have thousands of classes ready for our employees to study. The sign up rate is very high. So when the business is ready to take off, they are ready. Jen San, who is the CEO of Trip.com Group, thank you. Really appreciate it. All the best. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jane. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel, our Twitter and Facebook account. From me, Tianwei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. See you again tomorrow. Bye for now.